We're in part four of our January series called Dawn is Coming. And we've been on a journey through the extraordinary biblical book of First Peter, and we've made it all the way to chapter four. So if you got a copy of God's word with you, grab your B-I-B-L-E and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. Get some notes ready. It'd be a great idea to take notes in church, especially if you want to grow and you're here. So I'm assuming you want to grow. So grab your Bible if you got one. Grab some some way to take notes. And I'm going to start in verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 4. Starting in verse 3, we're going to read all the way through verse 11. I'm going to read out the NIV. And as you're finding your way there, because it's a tiny book in the New Testament, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Here's what it says. For you, Peter's talking to the early church, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. All that stuff, he says, that should be your past. They are surprised. Who's they, pastor? He's talking about the people that were a part of that old life with you. They are surprised that you no longer join them in their reckless, wild living. And so what do they do? Haters gonna hate. They heap abuse on you, but they will have to give accounts to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near, Peter says. Like, like pay attention. The end is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Maybe you didn't even grow up in church, but you're familiar with that phrase. That's where it comes from. Verse nine, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful Stewards, that's a fancy church word for manager, okay? That you would be a faithful manager of God's gracious gift in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as the one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. Well, what's the reason for this? So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ, to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. And notice that Peter even amens himself. He gets so pumped up as he's writing this. I got to tell y'all, sometimes I'm preaching and I got to amen myself. And so hopefully you'll amen me and help me out today because because of all this that we're doing, God is going to get all the glory for it. And to him alone, right, belongs all the glory and the power forever and ever can I get an amen in God's house? Such a good passage of scripture, and I'm going to borrow from it for my title. I'm calling this message, The End is Near. The End is Near. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you so much and so grateful for what you did in our 9.30 a.m. service. And I pray today, God, that you would do something unique and powerful and special in the room and those watching online. I pray, God, as we lean in to your holy text, that God, we would invite the word of God into our very essence, our beings, that we would apply your holy word to our lives, that we wouldn't just read it. We would ask the word to read us. And if there's anything in our lives that does not line up with your holy, powerful written word that we would ask ourselves to change because your word should not and does not change. So God, may we lean in with expectation that today in this moment, we have an opportunity to be changed by you. That is special. There is potential here. We're not just here to play patty cake, God. We're here to grow. We're here to learn, and we're here to be more like you. We love you so much, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Peter continues, and he does this throughout his entire letter. 
But Peter continues to address the early church, as I said, and he's talking to people that have been transformed by Jesus. And so if you've been transformed by Jesus, Peter is talking to you, he's talking to me. And as we read in chapter four, like, like he, he's not playing any games, is he? Like he gets all up in their business. He's like, I'm ready to coach you up. And he says this one big thing at the very beginning that, hey, you have spent enough time living life kind of that old way. And, and really, he says it this way. Write this down if you're taking notes. Number one, he says this, you need to now live like you know better. That's what he says right at the very beginning, verses three through six. Hey, you've been changed by Jesus. So leave the past in the past and you keep moving forward. Like, don't go back to that old way of living. Don't go back to those old habits. I know old habits die hard, but you keep pressing forward. Live like you know better, Peter says, because you do now know better. And he breaks down this better living in two ways. The first way we've already talked about that don't go back to your old way of living. Don't go back to your old way of life. R really, he means this. You, me, we've all sinned enough to like cover a lifetime, all right? Like we've made enough mistakes. There is no reason to repeat this cycle any longer. The old is gone, the new has come. You press forward. You live like you know better. That's the first side of this. Now at the beginning of this series, part one, the first Sunday in January, we talked about New Year's resolutions and we made some jokes tied to it. And I even shared some New Year's resolutions from kids that made us laugh and smile a little bit. But, but here's the deal about New Year's resolutions. And you know this, but you maybe never said it out loud. New Year's resolutions, they work for some people, but not for a lot of people. I didn't say this at the beginning of this year, but I've said it before in this church that the average person, and this is a little bit depressing, but it's reality. The average person gives up on their New Year's resolution by Valentine's Day. That, that's why the gym is crowded in January and it's hard to find a spot. Just wait till Valentine's Day and then it's smooth sailing. Now, now some of you, like it works for you. So you keep on keeping on not trying to get you off your New Year's resolution. But for most of us, it's a hard thing to stick to the change that we want. So, so, so I thought, especially after reading this, that, that if we want to live different, which we should want to, if we're believers in Jesus, then maybe we got to do something different. That's the definition of insanity, by the way, doing the same thing and expecting different results. And so let's do something different if we want to live Different. So I came across, and I think this is really cool, and I think you'll like it too. I came across what some people do in the new year in some areas of Italy. And I think it's maybe something we need to consider moving forward. Here's what they do on New Year's Eve. That a little bit before the stroke of midnight, in not every area in Italy, but in some areas, they clear the streets. Everybody's in their home, in their apartment, and they open up their windows. And then once the clock strikes midnight, what they begin to do is they begin to take all the old things from their past, things that represent pain from their past, hurt from their past. And literally, when the clock strikes midnight, they throw it out their window and onto the street to hear it and watch it smash into pieces representing what the Bible talks about, that the old is gone and the new has come. I don't know about you, but I like that. I like that a lot. Having that picture, that image that, man, I am done with this old way of living in youth ministry. I was a youth pastor for years, but in youth ministry, we used to do this on some of our big events on Wednesday nights. My wife will remember this and We'd have all these teenagers come on out and literally we'd have altar calls at the very end where we'd have like 50 teenagers come down to the front of a church building and surrender their life to Jesus. And they're crying and there's snot everywhere. I mean, it's just, it, it's a beautiful mess. It's just incredible. And what we would do at some of these big events is after these teenagers would give their life to Jesus, we had all of these like ceramic uh, plates and cups that were at the altar at the front here. And we had Sharpies all around. And then we had this big box, wooden crate in the middle with a tarp over half of it. And what we would do is we'd tell those teenagers, hey, we want you to take a physical step representing what Jesus just did in your life spiritually. 
And so he'd have them write down their sins on those ceramic plates, those sins that God had just forgiven them for, and then we had them smash them. And so we had some teenagers, y'all, and they were so excited, just sharpening all these different things. Man, God's forgiven me of this and this and this, and then as hard as they can, throwing it into that box and it making this loud crash and we would celebrate. And it was awesome. I, mean, even, I remember even one teenager, I don't know how they did this, but they missed the box one time and it hit the side of the box and bounced across the stage and everybody's having to jump over it on the worship team. But it was awesome. Like maybe we need to do that on a Sunday morning. I don't know. But I'm just telling you, we need to live different. So maybe we need to think different. Maybe you don't need a New Year's resolution because those don't last for a lot of people. Maybe you need to stop going back to your past, your old way of living. Maybe you need to leave the past in the past, Peter would say. That's the first side of this. Live like you know better, because if you know Jesus, you now know better. Here's the second side of it. Peter says this, we just read it. He says, leave the judgment to the judge. Man, I didn't get amens this service or first service either at that point. I just knew it. Gonna step on some toes. I, this isn't me. This is what Peter says. He says, leave the judgment to the judge. He says, hey, God is going to judge those living in sin. Absolutely. The friends, and really they're not friends. The people from your past that are upset that you're trying to live different. The people from your past that are mad that you're not partaking in those same things anymore, that you've now got standards that you're holding yourself to. Those people, don't worry about them. God will judge them, but don't stop reading. What does Peter say next? He says, he will also judge you. Living and the dead, all of us will be at one time judged by God. That's truth, but here's reality for a lot of people in the church, not just our church, church in general. A lot of people, they misunderstand their role in the courtroom of eternity. We got people walking around in the body of Christ that think they're the judge. But what did Peter say? God's the judge. He's the one. We got people in the body of Christ walking around like they're Judge Judy, gavel in hand, making millions of dollars. By the way, Google that later. She makes way too much money. I am just saying, like way too much money. Well, we got people in the body of Christ. Maybe that's you walking around all rise. They got their nice shiny robe on all the way to the ground. Show me respect. People thinking it's my job to judge. It's my, like I am judge, jury, and executioner. We got people that act that way. And I got to tell you, Peter's very clear. That is not your role. It's God's role. So stop trying to take God's place. But we have other people that they've got a different issue. They've got things twisted in the courtroom of eternity. We got people that they think their role is to be the plaintiff. We got people in the body of Christ, they think it's their role to be the accuser, that they've got a moral obligation. Man, they feel so righteous about it. Man, I got a moral obligation to bring the accusations to pick this person's good and this person's bad. Hey, this person did this crime, this politician is evil, and this one is not. They think their role in the courtroom of eternity is to be the accuser. Can I tell you, that is not your role. That's the devil's role. And if you don't know that, you need to read the Bible again because you either didn't read it or you didn't read it correctly. The Bible is really clear that the devil's job is to accuse. He's the accuser. He's the plaintiff. He's the one coming against people saying, you know what? They did this and they did this. That's not your role. And so we got people in the body of Christ that are trying to be the judge. We got people in the body of Christ that are trying to be the accuser. Instead, know your role. In fact, would you look at somebody today and say, know your role. Come on, tell them today. Know your role. Here's your role. You're the accused. I know you don't like that role, but it's reality. It's truth. You're the accused. The devil is bringing accusations against you. And guess what? You are guilty. You are. You're guilty 
I'm guilty. The Bible says we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We are the accused. We are guilty. That's the bad news. Here's the really, really good news. If you surrendered your life to Jesus, if you've accepted his free gift of grace, if you've given him your all, if you're all in on Jesus, Jesus, you are my Lord, you are my Savior, then God the judge looks at you and says, you know what? You are guilty, but I forgive you. Go and sin no more. I appreciate some people trying to help me out today. Like, like, come on, jump on board. I know it's a hard word, but it's an important word, okay? But you know what? Yeah, that's good news, but it gets even better. Because of what Jesus has done for us, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, because of his precious, it is precious, his precious blood that covers us, it gets even better because God looks at you and me right in the eyes and he says, you're not guilty, you're righteous because of my son. Not only is it clemency, not only is it forgiveness, like we understand forgiveness a little bit, right? Like you've forgiven somebody before, you, you let it go, you moved on, but the audacity, God looks at us and because of his son's sacrifice, he says, you're righteous. That is incredible news. So know your role. You are not the accuser and you are not the judge. You leave the judgment to the judge and you just thank God for what he's done for you and for me. What does Peter say to the church? He's talking to Christians. You need to live like you know better. Like you know better. You told that to a kid maybe this past week. Like, you know better than that. Why didn't you write on the wall with Sharpie? You know better than that. But Peter's saying that to us. Man, you know better than that. You're not the accuser. Like, do you see how ridiculous that is? Christians acting like they're the devil. Talk about misinformed, misled. I mean, that is awful. And the Holy Spirit's convicting some people. I could see it on your faces. Whoa, I thought I was living for God. I didn't realize I was trying to be the role of the devil in my culture in America. God, forgive me. I realized today that I am actually the accused. Forgive me, Lord, and thank you not only for your forgiveness, for your blood that covers me and how you see me righteous, not because of what I have done, but what your son did for me on the cross. Peter's like, leave your past in the past. Don't go back to that old life, but also leave the judgment to the judge. You are not Judge Judy, okay? Just take it with you. <laughs> leave that with you for the rest of the day. Know your role in the court. Here's the second point. Peter says this. Live like your life depends on it. So number one, live like you know better because you do if you're following Jesus. Number two, live like your life depends on it. This is verses seven through 11. Now, when you do something with this idea that, hey, my life depends on it, like you, you pay extra attention, right? Like you're serious about it. For example, you're going skydiving, and they're given the instructions. You're watching a video on how do you pull the emergency parachute? You're paying attention, aren't you? Right? You, you are. Why? Because your life depends on it. You're paying close attention to every single detail, every single instruction, because you know what I know. No man, no woman can fall 2,000 feet from the sky and survive if they don't have a parachute. Like, you know that, not rocket science. So you are paying attention because your life depends on it. And I got to tell you, yes, we're talking a little bit physical. Peter says the end is near for all of us, but also we're talking spiritual to live your life on purpose and with purpose. 
to not just survive here on earth and wait for heaven one day, but to live with the end in sight. Let me talk to the married people for a second. I talked to you a lot this last week because Peter talks that way at the beginning of chapter three. You should have your marriage be such a marriage that you're loving your spouse, you're forgiving your spouse, that you're treating them in such a great way with the end in sight. That if you've been married five years, you should be leading your marriage in your marriage in such a way that you want to make it 50 years, 60 years, that you would live now in the present with the end in sight because the end is near. Some of you don't believe me, but I'm telling you the Bible's clear, not just here, but in Old Testament and New Testament. The Bible says this about you and me, we are but a mist, a vapor, we are here today, gone tomorrow. We're a flower, fully bloomed. But y'all know, just like I do, flowers fade. Flowers come and go. Well, when's the world gonna end? The title of your message, the end is near. No one knows but God. But I do know this, we're closer now than they were in Peter's time. And yet Peter said, hey, listen up. Live like your life depends on it because Jesus is coming again. Like live ready, be ready. Live in such a way that you've got heaven in mind as you live here on earth. To live with a vision and a purpose. Time is short, Peter says. Life isn't long. Pay attention Live like your life depends on it because it does. And so over verses seven through 11, those few verses, Peter gets real practical, doesn't he? And if you got the Bible still open, look at the word of God. If you closed it, you closed it too early. Keep it open. We're gonna go through this together. But Peter, he gets real practical. He breaks it down. He's like, I wanna give you some handles. This is how you grab a hold of what I'm saying. This is how you live your life on purpose and with a purpose. He says this at the very beginning in verse seven. He says, you need to pay extra attention to your prayers. Your prayers. If you're taking notes in church, would you write that down? Your prayers. What does he say in verse seven? If you got it open, check it out again. He says, be clear-minded, be sober-minded, have self-control. Why? So that you can pray. Some of you just kind of gloss right over that. There's a reason. It's so that you can pray. Can I encourage you? We're at the end of 21 days of prayer and fasting. I'm hungry, and I know many of you are hungry. You best believe I'm hungry for some food tonight after our encounter night service. But can I tell you something else? I am hungrier for the presence of God. But it's not just me. It's many people in our church, people who are a part of this thing in person and online. Man, I'm telling you, don't neglect your prayer life. Keep praying. You struggle in your marriage, keep praying. You're struggling in your health, keep praying. Somebody you know and love has COVID, you better keep praying. Your prodigal son or daughter away from God, you better keep praying. Man, I need a miracle, you need to keep praying. And I'm telling you, prayer moves the hand of God. Prayer dispatches angels. Prayer, it not only touches God's heart, but again, it moves God's hand. Prayer, it activates. It's the password. I'm telling you, you need to keep praying. God hears your prayers and he will respond to your prayers. And tonight, I think about it, 21 days of prayer and fasting leading to tonight. I know my wife and I, we need a miracle. You probably need a miracle in some facet, some area of your personal life, your family life. You better be here tonight with expectation. You got a whole bunch of people that have been praying for 21 days and we just know God's gonna move. It's not an opinion. It's a fact. It's going to happen. Peter says, pay careful attention to your prayers. Don't you stop believing and don't stop praying. You keep believing that God is going to move and he will move. He cares. He listens. He is powerful. He's not some just like 
far off distant God that's too busy for you. No, no, no. He hears you. He knows you and he wants to help you. I got to tell you, that's the faith I'm bringing tonight. What are you bringing tonight when you come in? By the way, don't let a little rain or fog stop you from getting here tonight, okay? It rains like every day in Houston. Get used to it. I'm trying to get used to it. I ain't used to it being from Dallas, but I'm trying to get used to it. So get here tonight with that expectation. Peter says, pay careful attention to your prayers. Moving down to verse eight, you got the word still open. Come on, we're studying together. Let's grow together. What's he say in verse eight? Peter talks next about your people. Would you write that down? Your people. What does he say? He says, cover each other with love. Protect each other with love. I, I gotta tell you this. I hope you'll write this down too. The church that loves one another deeply is a church that can forgive one another quickly. That's what Peter's talking about exactly what he's talking about. That you've got to love other Christians in such a way that you can forgive them when they hurt you easily. That's what God wants for your marriage, your relationships. That's what he wants for his church, his bride. Can I tell it to you in another way? Peter's basically saying, stop majoring on the minors. If they're all in on Jesus, you should be all in with them. I got to tell you, it drives me crazy how people of God allow minor denominational leanings to get in the way of their love for one another. That is not of God. God says instead, you should love them deeply. And even if you disagree about the minor, as long as you're all about the major, which is Jesus, you can live together. You can operate together. You can see God's kingdom be established more and more on this earth. But it starts with love. Can I tell you something? We can disagree about the minor things and we can still love each other we can still serve together. We can still be in the same church together. If you're all in for Jesus, I'm all in with you, baby. Let's do this together. He says, hey, pay attention to your prayers. Pay attention to your people. Here's something else he says. Keep moving with me here. I believe it's verse nine. What's he say? Hey, you should offer hospitality without grumbling. Hospitality without grumbling grumbling. Now, that seems like it's an easy thing to do. And I think that's why he added in the without grumbling part. Because we can serve people, but we can have a hor- horrible attitude at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like you, you can invite somebody over to your house, but still be a jerk to them the whole time, right? And so Peter adds that in on purpose, like hospitality without complaining. What does grumbling sound like? That's grumbling. That's what my stomach is doing right now, okay? That's grumbling. Peter says, be nice, be kind, offer hospitality, but do not complain about it. It's a big deal. And I don't know what you think about when you think about hospitality, but I think about our small groups, our connect groups, you doing life with one another, That's what God's called us to. Talk about your people. You are called to find your people, your tribe. You're called to do life with other people. But here's what's happened. And COVID did not help. But more people are lonely today than ever before. You can be a room like this filled with people and still be lonely. You can have a big family that you're watching this like online. They're right beside you right now, but still be lonely. You can be married and still be lonely. You can have kids or grandkids or best friend and you still be lonely. Talk about a pandemic, COVID-19. Epidemic is loneliness. So many people are lonely. And what, what we do when we're lonely is we blame it on everybody else. But what does God say in his word? If you wanna find friends, you make yourself friendly. And so we all have a a role in that. In loneliness, it's literally killing people. Suicide rates have gone up exponentially. People are so isolated. Maybe you feel that way even in a room like this. Here's what Dr. Douglas 
Nemesek said, and I probably butchered his last name, but I don't know him, he don't know me, so it's gonna be all right. But here's what he said about loneliness. It's a big deal. Spiritually, of course, but also physically to your health. He's the chief medical officer for behavioral health at Cigna. Here's what he says about loneliness. Loneliness has the same impact on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Do I have your attention now? So if you're gonna keep isolating, you might as well just go all the way and pick up a new habit and smoke that cigarette like a chimney, okay? You might as well pick that up as well. Think about that. He goes on to say in the quote, I didn't read this part, but it's worse than being obese. So get in a group. We're trying to push you as much as we can. We got stickers on the floor in the lobby. We got stuff hanging from the ceilings. We're trying, but you've got to step up. You've got to get in it. Ask anybody that was in a group this last semester. We had a lot of people in groups and they will tell you it was absolutely worth it. We had so many people, like we didn't try to get responses, like coming to us. Hey, I am so grateful. We had this, I am like, this meant so much. Even the virtual groups, they're so grateful, so grateful. Find your people, Peter says. So you pay attention to your prayers, your people. Here's, here's the last one. He says, write this down. Pay attention to your part. Your prayers, your people, your part. This is how he ends it. Do you remember? He says, you all have a part to play inside the church. Well, how, how does he say? He says, you've got a gift. And gift is one of those church words that we say a lot, but no one defines. And there's a lot of grown people that have no clue what their gift is. So I wanna help you. What's my gift, pastor? It's something that God has put on the inside of you to use to bring Him glory and to build His kingdom. It's something you're passionate about. It's something you would describe, and it's actually an incorrect description, but you would describe it this way, that it's something I'm gifted at naturally. That's actually wrong. It's something you're gifted at supernaturally because God put that gift in you. A gift is something that comes easier to you than it does to other people. Your gift is that thing that even as a kid, people would call out in you. Man, you're really good at this. Oh, you're so good at this. That's your gift. Many of us have one gift, but there's also some people that have multiple gifts. And our job is not to judge you know, what we have against somebody else's or compare and contrast. Our job is to be faithful, Peter says, right? To be a good steward, to pour into that gift, to stretch that gift, to use that gift, to get better and better. Now, here's what happens in culture is people, they use their gifts to make money. They, they use their gifts to bring themselves fame. But all of that is like secondary. You should first and foremost, use your gift to build God's kingdom. So make money, like get some notoriety all, all you want, but that should not be your focus. Using your gift in God's house should be the focus. And if you think I'm lying, read the verses again. Peter is very clear. It's in the church, your part. The excuse that people give a lot of times for not using their gift in church is, is this, that you know what, it, my gift doesn't really matter. My gift is too small. You hear that a lot as a pastor, and that's not just us, it's just churches in general people that think that way. And if you think that that way, you're misled. Because what Peter says here, and it says in many other places in the word of God, is that every part matters and all parts coming together helps us accomplish something big. Think about our vision. It's a big vision, heaven full and hell empty. I can't do it by myself. It's when we all come together playing a part, that's when we accomplish something big for God. You see, you can do what I cannot do. And maybe I can do what you can't do, but together we can accomplish a lot for God's kingdom to bring him glory forever and ever. Amen. So you've got to do your part. And you can't belittle 
your gift. It reminds me of what happened back in the 1960s. I gotta get you to catch this and hopefully this illustration will help. In the early 1960s, President Kennedy, as you know, he gave a very, very powerful speech in front of the nation. You've probably, maybe you caught it live, but you've definitely, I'm sure, heard parts of it. And President Kennedy, at the beginning of the 1960s, he stood up on a platform and he said to the nation, hey, by the end of this decade, you know what I'm about to say, we're gonna get a man to the moon, but we're also gonna bring him home safely. Think about that. This is 50 years ago. That's still a really, really, really hard task today. Never happened before. It's a big vision. That's a big goal. You, you, you know that part, but you probably don't know the next part. In that same speech, President Kennedy, JFK, he wanted people, every American to own this big vision. And so he said this later on, in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. It will be an entire nation for all of us must work to put him there. He wanted the entire country to be responsible for us getting a man to the moon and returning him home safely. Well, a little later in the 1960s, I love this. JFK, he is touring, touring the new NASA headquarters right here in Houston, Texas. One of the first things we did moving here a few years ago, let's go to NASA. It was awesome. So President Kennedy, JFK, he's, he's walking through NASA headquarters and he sees a man with a mop and he approaches him and he asks him, sir, what do you do here? What do you do? And I love his response. Here's what he says. I'm working to get a man to the moon. I'm working to get a man to the moon. Let's be honest. Like, how would have you responded? Like, what would I have said? Man, I, I probably would have said, I'm cleaning the floors, president. I'm about to take out the trash. You know, these people are dirty, man. Like, I, I'm working hard. Like, that's what I would have said and probably what you would have said. But this janitor, he caught the vision, didn't he? He knew that if I do my part, even though other people belittle my occupation, that my role is important and I am not focused on a task. Instead, I'm focused on a big vision. And if I'll play my part, it is just as important as Neil Armstrong's part. And if you don't believe that, you don't know God's word because that's exactly what God's saying. That if you are faithful with your gifting, and if I am faithful with my gifting, even though others may belittle them, when they're added together, we can accomplish a lot for the kingdom of God. And if this janitor can think that way with getting a man to the moon, you better believe we should start thinking that way, seeing people get to heaven with Jesus. Man, y'all tracking with me right now? Like, I need you to catch this from our tech team, pushing nothing like knobs and turning buttons or vice versa, doing crazy stuff in the back that we don't see. To our worship team and, and our cafe team and our ushers and everybody in between to the people like kids volunteers, youth volunteers, people you don't even see that come up in the middle of the week folding worship guides. Like they put on gloves and masks and they use using sanitizer like crazy and nobody cheers for them coming in, but they're faithful to serve. I'm telling you, it all makes a difference. And what's happened in the church is we focused on the task instead of the vision. So I gotta tell you, you gotta change your thinking. Like when you greet, you're not just opening doors and saying hello through a mask, you're welcoming someone into the family of God. I wanna connect the dots for you. 
You're not just building blocks with a preschooler. You're building their foundation on God's Word. You're not just playing a game with a teenager on a Wednesday night. You're preparing them for war as they battle the enemy. You're not just giving money to a nonprofit. You're investing into kingdom work that's changing the world. You're supporting missionaries all around the globe. You're a part of something bigger than yourself. But you got to play your part. You've got to stop belittling your gift. Can I tell you something? This is your homework. The next time you're serving, somebody asks you what you're doing, don't you dare focus on your task anymore. You focus on our vision. I'm telling you, when somebody gets saved, you played a part in that. For those people that got dunked in water last week, you were in the tank with them. You may not even know their names or remember their stories, but I'm telling you, you played a role in that. Every missionary family that we faithfully support every single month, you may never get on the same mission field that they're on right now in a different country, but every dollar that you give, I'm trying to encourage you today. It all matters, but you gotta play your part. This is where it's gonna real, hit real hard for many. If you are not serving, if you are not faithfully fulfilling your part in the church, you, you go volunteer somewhere else, but that's not what Peter says. He's talking about the church. If you're not fulfilling your part, there's people we can't reach. I know it hurts, but you need to hear it. Those of you that used to serve that are no longer serving, it's time to step up. It's time to get back in the game. What have I said to you before? You sit on the sideline long enough, you know what's gonna happen? You're gonna get a sore butt. Did he just say that? Yes, I did, I'll say it again. You're gonna get a sore butt. Get in the game, serve. Don't wait till COVID-19 ends. Like it's time now, you're watching online. Let us know there's ways that you can serve even being in a different room. I'm telling you, if you'll play your part and I'll play my part, we will change the world for Jesus Christ. There's people that only you can reach if you use your gift. And what's Peter say at the very end of this? I'm almost done. Remember, he gets so pumped up. He gets so fired up writing this letter that he starts to have a praise break. Somebody pulled out, man, they, they got the synth music going. Like they're, they're, there's wind instruments and brass instruments. It's like old school Pentecostal stuff. It's breaking out. And what's Peter doing? He's like, man, God gets the glory for this. He gets fired up. People serve him. People helping one another. Man, God gets the glory. God, God you're awesome. To you alone gets all the glory and all the power forever and ever. And then what's he do at the end? He amens himself. That's how I feel preaching this message. I get fired up thinking about you using your gift, not to make money, but to build God's kingdom. Peter says, stop the excuses. Live like you know better and live like your life depends on it. Last thing, not only does your life depend on it, other people's lives depend on it. There's people in your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, your classmates, that if you don't use your gift, they may not be reached. Well, that's heavy, pastor, I know, but you have a responsibility to use your gift that God has given you to be faithful with it. Let's pray. Jesus, feel you moving in this place. I know you're convicting. I know you're sharpening. And I pray, God, that whatever part of this message that we needed to hear, that you would seal it right now. And no one would come in and snatch up that word. But God, we would protect it right now. We would pull it close. I pray for the believers listening in the room online. God, may we leave the past in the past, not going back to old ways, old habits. I pray, God, that we would leave the judgment to the judge. That we would faithfully fulfill our role in the courtroom of eternity. We are not the judge, and we are definitely not the accuser. We are the accused. But because of your grace, 
because of your mercy, not only can we be forgiven, but also you see us as righteous because of the precious blood of Jesus. God, I pray for anybody that's given up on praying for that miracle. I pray that faith even now would rise up to pray again, believe again. Our prayers not only move your heart, they move your hand. We be clear-minded, sober-minded, self-controlled so that we can pray. I pray God for those that they feel so isolated. They they feel so alone, lonely. I, I pray God that today you would encourage them that if they wanna find friends, they need to make themselves friendly, take initiative to join a group, to plug into community, to do life together. That if they haven't been plugged in, that this would be that semester, that as soon as they can on Monday morning, February 1st, they would log on online to see the options that even now they start to talk to people. Hey, what group are you in? God, may you start that in us. We need it more than we maybe even realized before today. We're called to find our people, our tribe, And I pray, God, for anybody that's maybe given up on serving, I pray the excuses would stop and instead we would do whatever it takes to leverage our gift for the kingdom, to play our part, no matter what it looks like, to be faithful with what you've given us, to build your kingdom, not to make another buck, but to build your kingdom, to live our life on purpose and with purpose. And if we'll all do our part, there is no one that can stop us. If we'll all play our parts, we'll make a significant impact for your kingdom. Thank you, God, for speaking to us today. And lastly, I pray, if there's anybody that's far from you, I pray today would be their day of salvation. Like I've said many times, we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of your glory. And we can't rescue ourselves. We can't defend ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. And so I pray right now there'd be people in this room and online that would invite you in that would say, Jesus, come rescue me. Like, come save me. Forgive me of my sin. I put my trust in you. I believe Jesus, come on, you can talk to him, you can whisper to him. I believe Jesus that you died on the cross, that you rose from the dead. So I pray now because of what you've done for me, that the old would be gone, that the new would come, that you'd give me a fresh start, that you'd save my soul. I accept your gift of grace and mercy upon my life. Thank you for your precious blood that covers me. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. We love you so much. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you sensed God's presence. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ, or if your life has been impacted in any way, please send us an email at info at ChristCub.net. We would love to hear your story. And for those that committed your life to Christ, we want to help you on your new journey by sending our free Start Bible Kit in the mail. If you'd like to partner with us financially, simply click on the Give tab at ChristCove.net. There it will take you to a safe and secure page where you can set up a one-time or recurring gift to help us accomplish our vision, heaven full and hell empty. And as always, you can find out more about Christ Covenant on our website or on Facebook or Instagram at Christ Cove Houston.